Zoom. Um, and normally this workshop we do I do um, in person. Um, so this is this is uh, this is I've done I've done webinars and so on before, so it's not a brand new experience, but um, so I am going to do something I usually I haven't done, which is before. Um, oftentimes when I do this presentation, I start out usually, in fact, start out with talking about dyslexia, about which there's a lot of research and a lot of things to share. And sometimes it crowds out the section on um, dyscalculia or a math, um, math disability or and uh, dysgraphia, which has to do with writing and handwriting and so on. So I decided this time I'm gonna flip it and I'm gonna start with um, dyscalculia, math uh, difficulties and, um, and go from there. So um, I will, uh, and, and we have plenty of time for um, dyslexia this morning. I don't know that I'll be taking all three hours that this is scheduled for, uh, because that's a lot of time to be on a screen. However, we should have plenty of time to get through things. So I'm gonna share my screen with you, and um, you'll be seeing my PowerPoint slides. And I will start my presentation here. Um, Uh, and let's see. I'll move this out of the way here. There we go. Okay, super. So um, again, um, I am, uh, as you know, I'm Ellen Engstrom, and I'm the director of curriculum at Groves Academy. Um, I have spent a great, uh, a great deal of my career working with students with learning disabilities and with um, dyslexia and related language-based learning um, disabilities. And I am uh, uh, really excited to be sharing this information with you. So um, what we'll be doing today is uh, we're gonna start, as I said, and talk about dyscalculia, which is the the uh, fancy name for um, math uh, difficulties, dysgraphia, which dys, of course, meaning the Greek prefix, uh, me meaning uh, the Greek prefix of, um, <clears throat> of not, uh, and uh, calculia comes, you know, again, is uh, from, uh, comes from, uh, Latin, I believe, for calculate, cal where we get the word calculation and so on. Um, and graphia has to do with letters, has to do with writing. And then we'll go into talking about dyslexia and how the reading brain works and what happens in the reading brain of somebody with dyslexia. So that's our plan for today. So, this is a little bit fuzzy, I'm afraid, but this gives you a, um, a kind of an overview of, uh, you know, what we call specific learning disorders or SLD. And if you've ever had a, um, if you've ever had a, uh, a read a psychoeducational assessment, looked at diagnoses, sometimes. Um, particularly on um, if you've ever had a child with an IEP, you may see the initials SLD, and then it will list. <clears throat> uh, oftentimes, we'll not use dyslexia and dysgraphia but in, or dyscalculia, and we'll say reading disorder or uh, writing or math or whatever. But they are related in a lot of ways. So as you can see, dyslexia, really is the more, most common of these specific learning dis disorders. Um, and uh, 
And there are a number of issues with dyslexia, which we'll get to. Dysgraphia and dyscalculia are related um, and have some overlap with dyslexia. So not everybody with dyscalculia has dyslexia. Um, and lots of people who have dysgraphia have elements of dyslexia, but may be able to read pretty well, but they have more difficulty with spelling, so on. So um, we will, they are related. Um, and so we'll start with dyscalculia. And um, the thing to remember about a lot of these, um, these, these diagnostic terms is sometimes things look like it's a learning disorder or learning problem with the child, but can also be, be exacerbated or even caused by very poor instruction. So, you know, here's, here's the, the cartoon that I love. How do you know I have a learning disability? Maybe you have a teaching disability. And so the role of teachers in, <clears throat> of having appropriate teachers for math, writing, reading is extremely important. So, <clears throat> There are, there's less research significantly uh, in math disorders or math, dis, you know, math learning disabilities than there are, uh, than there is for dyslexia, a lot less. And so we know some things um, and we have theories of, of what may cause things, but I think it's important to remember with math there can be a number of different, uh, different things going on in the brain that uh, cause difficulty with math that may not necessarily um, be the same. So we have to, when you have, uh, when you have a child with, who's having a lot of difficulty with math, it's really important to dig down and figure out what it, it, you know, through a good assessment, what exactly is going on? Because it may not be, it's not like it's always the same. So Stanislas Dehaene is a French neuroscientist, um, neuropsychologist who's done a great deal of research on both reading and math. Um, and he makes the point that, uh, that exact calculation is very dependent on language. So learning math and, and uh, performing operations and problem solving is very dependent on the language that, um, uh, that, that, that the student has the native language of the student, which some languages are harder and more complicated than others. And also teachers play a big role in making, uh, they are really a mediator between the math and the student and their ability to explain and demonstrate and model is very crucial. So basically we do have some innate ability for, um, for number sense, but it's, but it's very limited. Um, so that, um, you know, the, um, we, um, we, you know, approximating things, we, you know, it's, there's been research that shows um, that uh, young children can uh, basically can sort of tell the difference between objects, numbers of objects, up to about four objects. Um, so they can get a sense of three or four or two or whatever. But beyond that, a lot of this is using, uh, using neural pathways in the brain that maybe weren't necessarily specifically developed or evolved to do complex math. So we have to, uh, you know, some of it is very dependent on our ability to sort of make visual spatial uh kind of you know approximations and guesses you know those you know those um uh, uh often in uh there'll be little quizzes like how many beans do you think are in this jar or 
how many pennies do you think? And you know, you you kind of eyeball it, and uh, and I know I always find who knows, you know. But some people are very good at that, and that has to do not with their verbal abilities, but their ability to you know kind of kind of detect. Uh, you know, more specifically, they have such a good number sense in how things stack up. They can figure that out and come close. I can't do that at all. But um, so approximation oftentimes requires good visual spatial ability. And then, you know, our ability to do, to approximate numbers is different than what we need to um to do calculation and problem solving because calculation and problem solving in math are both in both involved a lot of language um so our visual uh, visual spatial ability in some ways um in some ways is somewhat separate from our ability to you know do operations and remember the steps and do problem solving and so on so um, consequently, um, calculation and higher level math are more difficult than other cognitive processes. Um, even more difficult, I think, than writing, uh, you know, writing a, a, a lengthy piece or something. So um, the other thing that we do know is number sense is a genetic trait. So um, so there is some, you know, people who have good um, number sense or whatever, well, may run in, in families to some extent, but exact calculation involves cultural tools. So while we are, you know, while we have number sense that comes to us sort of naturally that we um, you know that we have a genetic predisposition for but it's our culture that determines what our symbols are going to be um, what our algorithms are going to be and uh, and those have to be taught by you know using language and modeling and you know teaching the language of math in in, in a lot of ways and that uh that is done by parts of the brain just like reading that really have evolved for other purposes so essentially what we're doing what we're able, you know what uh what we have to do is build the neural pathways in the brain that borrow uh the function of some other uh <clears throat> of some other neural pathways and allow them to become, you know, to specialize somewhat in, uh, you know, in, in calculation and problem solving. So nature gives us our number sense, but culture provides the numerals and the number words. And that makes a big difference because um, it's um, in, uh, in, uh, English, which is a kind of a clunky language, um, our number words are long, and not only that, but they they every every decade um, or every ten it switches. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then we have all these different terms for you know eleven and twelve and thirteen, and then we begin to say fourteen, fifteen, 15 and then we go into the twenties and then the thirties and so on. So it's um, that is. Uh, and, and that seems very natural to us, those of us who've been through school and so on, but it's actually, um, you know, it actually takes up more bandwidth, you know, in the uh, sort of in the, uh, and more uses more cognitive load just to process the language, interestingly. So another thing, so there's that issue with innate number sense versus learning the numerals and language that are given to us by whatever culture we're in. Then there's issues with memory, which human memory is very much associative. We, we like to associate, um, we often learn by association. So we think of um, uh, 
oftentimes we associate it like for example if we use a uh a mnemonic um to uh to remember things i remember learning every good boy does fine to learn the learn the um, musical staff notes and so on um but the problem with that it's very innate in humans um that the associations can kind of interfere with each other so seven and six then we have different signs well you know we may know that seven and six is 13 but seven times six and do we get the signs mixed up so it's that that causes some issue there we've just sort of associations a little bit gone awry and then the other thing is multiplication facts which is something that you know is uh people think is sort of a determining uh, factor on whether you get to you know move along and become an adult or something um they have they have to be stored in a form that doesn't really fit that well with how human memory is organized and in fact people learn their multiplication facts but as they move into other things where they don't need to use multiplication facts all the time the adults make a lot of errors um in just with single digit multiplication um and you know they may be better at the uh at multiplicate remembering multiplication facts that involve the numbers one through five but then you get into the six sevens eights and nines and the further up you go the more likely it is that someone will make a mistake um so they don't hold on that well or, or can easily slip um and um then again as we said the challenge of language is great so we have special words you know for 11 through 19 and then for the decades 20 through 90 and this seems like small but actually it it limits the number of <clears throat> digits a person can remember so uh you may be aware that in <clears throat> in uh um, in various tests of short-term memory and so on there's the digit span test where <clears throat> where uh someone the examiner uh gives a bunch of numbers and then somebody has to repeat those numbers well th the average english-speaking person can remember seven digits from a string of digits and in fact telephone numbers used to be seven digits until you know until we got into um area codes and now nobody remembers phone numbers because our phones automatically do it for us in any event um in asian countries china japan and so on where they have um a different <clears throat> different uh writing system and so on the average person in china and asia can remember 10 digits and that's not because they're smarter necessarily it's because the language of their number system is much easier to remember because of the way it's labeled which is you know an interesting thing um and um you know and language does affect how brains are organized and so on now we should talk a bit about working memory which is a big big factor in lots of um lots of learning challenges and i'm going to switch here because i want to just explain how this works a little bit working memory is uh largely exists in the frontal lobe of the brain and a little bit on the in the parietal lobes on the sides of the brain working memory is really the problem solving uh area of the brain and re and is crucial to learning and it really does four things the first thing it does is it allow it helps us focus our attention so that we pay attention to something it it operates really just over a few seconds um 
and it serves as a temporary storage place for incoming information and stored information. So if you have to solve a, a math problem, you know, <clears throat> you have to you have the incoming information of the numbers in the problem and and what it is, and then you have to retrieve from your long term memory uh, things like formulas or past you know dry, rely on past experience and so on, and then working memory allows you to manipulate that information and come out with an answer. So <clears throat> all four of these things are really crucial. Um, and working memory, how m working memory functions has a lot to do with what can, we can get stored in our long-term memory. So when working memory is, uh, is <clears throat> doesn't, can't hold as much information if it's compromised, which is the case in a lot of learning disabilities and attention deficits, then we uh, then that becomes a limiting factor. Um, so one of the things that happens in math is that you have to have a very uh, speedy and efficient retrieval from your long-term memory. Well, where does that where where does that retrieval those things uh, go? Well, they go into your working memory. And then you have to temporarily store numbers when you're attempting to solve a problem. And so then if you don't recall your facts, then, you know, or, or if you don't recall your facts or if you don't recall, you know, whatever the formula is, say for a, a rate, a time, distance problem or something like that, then it's going to lead to difficulties um, executing the procedures that need to happen in order to solve the problem. And that leads to people, you know, finding alternative ways to do it, which are oftentimes usually not nearly as efficient. So that uh, working memory uh, uh, ability, working memory strength, if you will, um, has a lot to do with how well we can, you know, how well we can we can manage math. Now, a lot of these things can be uh, can be accommodated for with the use of a calculator and some other other types of accommodation. But um, and I think it's you know we can talk about accommodations, but um, it, it's uh, important to uh, it's it, there's a difference between being to, being able to accurately calculate and, uh, operations, calculate numbers quickly, independently, and, and understanding the concept of what needs to happen. So uh, that's why it's really important, I think, for um, students to have, um, to have an understanding of where their mistakes come from and checking, uh, you know, a, when after problems have been um, accomplished and you know some recognizing some are right, some are wrong, to really look at the what and what where the wrong answers happen. Was it because they didn't understand the concept or was it because they didn't their calculation was off for various reasons? And um, and that helps with some of the um, anxiety uh, of worrying about wrong answers in math. So, uh, and we talked about that. So, then there are other other theories and other uh, research that tends to show that um, if we have trouble remembering words, in other words, um, in other words, the semantics or understanding of what the words mean. That's going to, and that's similar to the language issue that we talked about. That's going to cause difficulty with math fact retrieval. <clears throat> then there's also issues with procedural memory, like remembering <clears throat> how to, you know, uh, how to, what the steps are in carrying out procedures and solving problems. And, so like take long division, for example, which is just a bear for some students 
because you have to, you know, you've got multiple steps to solving a long division problem and lots of things can go wrong in the process. You can put things in the wrong uh, column. You can add when you're supposed to subtract. Um, you can mess up with decimal points. There's just all kinds of things that can go wrong. And a lot of those, again, it's not the concept, but the memory of what the procedures are. So having notes, reminders of, you know, what happens first, second, and so on um, is important. And like a lot of things, planning, thinking before, you know, before uh, acting on, uh, before going and carrying, carrying out the operation is an important thing to do. Um, and again, oftentimes sequencing in a multi-step procedure. And sometimes there's just delays in understanding concepts, which is uh, so that one, one pass through explaining how to do an operation or, um, <clears throat> or solve a particular problem is often just not enough and needs repetition. And again, I think um, in uh, some ways, having um, in uh, having teachers who will do um, who will make short videos explaining how to do something um, and making those available to students so they can go through that multiple times. Sometimes it takes uh, more than one pass and oftentimes a lot more than one pass. So providing support so that students get to review the, the practices um, and the procedures is very useful and helpful for everybody actually. And then visual spatial um, <clears throat> deficits can, uh, can cause lots of difficulty too, because that's where you find um, numbers may get misaligned, you know, so they're put in the wrong column and that's gonna lead to wrong answers. And also misinterpretation of place value. Place value is an extremely important concept that really students need to master in the, in the elementary grades in order for them to be able to move into the um, more uh, higher level concepts of algebra and geometry, et cetera. So, um, and of course, if you have visual spatial deficits, geometry is going to be extremely difficult. And uh, <clears throat> so it's there are, as you can see, what we've got here is a whole lot of different things that can cause trouble with math. So it's really important when, when trying to figure out or to, you know, do a deep dive into what is causing a student difficulty with math to really look at, you know, is it memory? Is it language? Is it, um, you know, is, is it a, a visual spatial issue? They're not keeping a column straight and so on. Now there are things you can do to help with that using graph paper um, to keep columns straight and uh, things of that nature can be really helpful and, uh, and are used widely, I think, uh, too. But it is something, uh, again, students need to know they have these issues in order to be able to over, overcome them. So, um, so talking about these things as though not with any judgmental, it's just this is the way your brain works, uh, is, is helpful. And here's an example, just if you imagine a visual spatial processing uh, disorder, means you just don't see things quite like other people do. So, you know, numbers um, are, uh, numbers are maybe wobbled. You may, you know, you may mix up, is it plus, is it minus? Um, and, you know, and again, of course, in subtraction, when you have to do, so uh, we don't call it borrowing anymore, we call it, um, renaming, I believe, um, <clears throat> uh, when you're crossing out numbers and putting little things. That's just, you know, that's just a recipe for 
uh, for making errors, even if you're not that careless. And again, too, um, you know, this approximation thing, how many cups of coffee, ugh, this is the sort of thing that drives me crazy anyway. And so these are the kinds of things, if you were viewed from the eyes of someone with a visual processing or a visual spatial processing dis, uh, difficulties, you can see where a lot of the visual aspects of math um, and can be extremely challenging. So um, the other thing that can can be that will uh, that often causes difficulty with math is um, you know we talk about the memory problems, but a lot some of that a lot of that may come from difficulty in our executive control system. So um, if a person has it has an executive function disorder or has uh, difficult, it has executive function issues that really reflect uh, it, problems in planning, organizing, uh, and also really affects working memory. That may cause problems with math. And it may not be, um, again, it may be a function of the um, of executive function and how that plays out and how that affects um, <clears throat> precise uh, precise uh, number manipulation and so on. So it the working memory system may not be accessing numerical information because from you know from the phonological or sound system, or it just may not have the capacity, um, the cognitive working space for processing information. And, and so when you have uh, cognitive uh, bandwidth problems, then it's gonna be difficult to do things in your head, to be able to come up with answers quickly, um, and you may be missing off, you know, things. So that it's it, there again, um, there again, one way to address these things is to, um, is to, is to break down um, some calculations into distinct steps, which of course means you have to remember what the steps are. But um, <clears throat> knowing that if you can, uh, again, setting up problems so that, and planning how to do it before you start doing it, uh, will make can make a big difference. And math has changed over time. Um, back when I was in school, when you know dinosaurs were cavorting outside the windows, um, our textbook math textbooks were filled with algorithms to solve, just algorithms. You know, nowadays you look at a textbook and it looks like a novel practically because of all the words and the problems and so on. That becomes that requires to do that kind of math that requires a lot more uh, working memory and um, and planning organizing how you're going to do the problem and so on um, which which for somebody again somebody with executive function that may be really difficult so uh, Good math teachers use a lot of, you know, teach students to do a lot, do a lot of, um, use visuals um, and uh, to, and look at keywords and figure out the facts and, and teach them how to plan to solve problems. They also may be slower at solving problems, which is why, you know, um, why teachers need to recognize that and you know, the idea that somebody has to do 25 problems for homework, do they really, do you really need to do 25 problems to, solve, you know, to be able to show that you're learning? Um, or would 10 do it? You know, I, I think hunting down on the number of these things um, for some students is entirely reasonable because of the amount of time it takes them to set up, plan, organize, and then 
accomplish the, uh, the tasks. Now, um, that is dyscalculia. So I am wondering, um, Joanna, do we have questions? Yeah, we do have one question that came in and uh -huh. it says, uh, wondering if there is a test for dyscalculia to try to narrow down the area of deficit or pinpoint semantic, visual, spatial, et cetera. Well, um, what there is, is um, very good psycho, very good, uh, very good psychoeducational assessment can do a lot to, uh, you know, to, uh, to give information about where there may be problems. So that, um, you know, and a good psychoeducational assessment involves doing um, a cognitive uh, assessment, which might be an IQ test or just a, a cognitive assessment. And that will tell you uh, a lot about um, processing speed, a lot about working memory capacity, and also attention, you know, memory, short-term memory, uh, and so on. And, um, and a good math assessment can uh, also then along with the cognitive piece of the uh, of the psychoeducational assessment is an academic assessment um, which tests um, reading, writing, spelling, and also math. And the math subtests are broken down into um, several parts. There's always a math fluency which gives single digit calculation for um, for addition, subtraction, and multiplication, and that's timed. Um, and that gives you a sense of how fast and how, how easeful it is for students to do that kind of calculation. Then there's also um, operations, which tests you know, your ability to add, subtract, multiply, and divide uh, uh, multi-digit numbers. And then there's a uh, problem solving part, which actually, um, you know, where students actually have to um, listen to a problem and then figure out, you know, what the answer would be. And that's more um, a test of how well they can process that information and uh, come up with with a correct answer. So based on that, you can sell, you can kind of tell how much of the math issue is conceptual, how much of it is memory, um, and, and then simply just you know, operation procedures and so on. Um, and so you know, combined with knowledge of working memory capacity and processing speed and sh short term memory and so on, and looking at math performance in those three dimensions, you get a pretty good idea um, to start with. Now, uh, unlike dyslexia, where you, you can get that kind of overview, but then there's all kinds of assessments to dig into how your phonological processing is and you know, so on and so forth. Um, we don't have as many tools to dig into um, the issue of math that we do for some of the language based, particularly, you know, reading and spelling. So that's basically, um, you know, and there are there are tests that um, that go deeper into areas of math, like the key math test and so on, um, that give you more information about uh, where the math deficits are. So that would be there is so that would be basically, you know, that would lead you down a path to you know for things to um, set, things to address. Okay, and there's sort of a follow up question to that too. Um, Great. From the educator's point of view, it says for the everyday teacher, what test could show this? Um, the key math test. Key math is an awfully long involved test. Um, you know, I think um, <clears throat> for the everyday math teacher, um, that's going to be difficult. You know, observation 
uh, is, is, you know, you having, uh, if you have someone who can give a standardized math test, um, or you, if you can do it, you know, but usually those are given one-on-one, -on -one, um, and um, so you can begin to sort of see. Um, I think what's important for the everyday math teacher is to be aware that there are a number of things that can go that can become a problem in for in math. One of them is language, which really has to do with you know which 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 teachers need to be aware of generally and a good teacher who can explain things well give sufficient practice and you know truly give students sufficient practice that they can become independent at doing uh, at doing math is really important um, and also um, modeling well and using language that is easy to understand and looking at uh, math problems diagnostically and looking to see now is what's the what's the error because error analysis will tell you a lot is it uh is the concept just off uh are there careless calculation errors are there um are there er you know errors that are more like um that are more based on visual spatial misalignment of numbers or are things just sort of um, just random? If you've got a lot of random errors that don't seem to make sense, that would probably lead you to, to think that there's maybe an executive function issue going on. And um, um, a lot of which can be helped by, um, you know, again, helping students, breaking down problems, teaching them a process, um, and um, uh, you know, which addresses a lot of those issues that lead to just working memory or cognitive overload. Is there anything else? Uh, nope, those are all the questions so far. Great, okay, super. Well, um, then um, I'll go into dysgraphia now and um, uh, and then after we do dysgraphia, we'll take a short break, okay? I think. So dysgraphia is one of the more misunderstood uh, learning dis disabilities, specific learning disabilities. People often think, it, well, it has to do with messy handwriting. And, uh, and while certainly uh, people with dysgraphia may have messy handwriting, it really is, it goes, it affects um, academic performance more broadly than that. And um, in general, what you're going to see with somebody who has a language based issue, um, like, you know, including dyslexia, but also dysgraphia, particularly, they may have trouble following directions. Um, they often have difficulty organizing their thoughts in speaking and or writing. Some people speak really well, but they cannot produce written work um, that is anything close to the quality of their um, ability to uh, speak. They generally need extra time to read or to write. And particularly, and this is particularly true of students with dysgraphia, is that they produce written work very sparse and it's filled with mechanical and spelling errors um, so um, and again writing doesn't seem to reflect the caliber of the thinking in class so students oftentimes will be brilliant uh, contributors to class discussions um, they seem to understand concepts and then when they have to write anything down, a summary, note taking, anything, very little of that comes through in the writing. And also um, uh, students with language-based learning difficulties often have trouble with foreign languages and so on. So, um, okay, and moving 
okay. So a child with dysgraphia um, may have trouble forming letters and numbers and words, and they also tend to have trouble with spelling. And they also have trouble organizing any kind of thoughts and ideas into written expression. You often, you know, there's a pretty good, um, there's a pretty good, pretty good overlap of dysgraphia with dyslexia, but you'll also see um, a lot of students who seem to read pretty well. And worse than their you know than their general ability cognitive ability or um or um you know reading ability and so on so um and dysgraphia true dysgraphia uh actually kids get diagnosed with dysgraphia frequently because they have messy handwriting, because their spelling is poor, because they don't do well on the writing test, on a um, standardized um, achievement test. But actually, uh, true dysgraphia would be somebody who truly has a, a visual motor issue that would be diagnosed by an occupational therapist. So I'll be honest, when I see uh, the diagnosis of dysgraphia on a, you know, on a, on a child's psychoeducational report, um, I, I don't necessarily take it as, you know, as like, oh my gosh, we'll never teach this child to write, because that's not true. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, so really good handwriting instruction can make a big difference. So, um, <clears throat> oftentimes, you know, the symptoms that you'll see in these children or <clears throat> is oftentimes they have a very poor pencil grip. They have really, I've seen some strange grips, people putting pencils between their middle and ring finger to write and things like that, which tends to reflect um, how, the quality of their handwriting instruction. And uh, then also, because of this, they often get really tired. I mean, and I would too, if, you know, if I had to, um, if I had to, if I had a grip like that. So, you know, and their writing is often illegible. It's, you know, it, they, it's inconsistent. They may make a spell something one way and Two lines later, they'll spell the same word a different way. Their letters and numbers are poorly formed. It takes them a long time. And they'll do, in many cases, anything to avoid writing. I mean, almost anything. Um, getting in trouble so they get sent out of the classroom so they don't have to write, things of that nature. So um, they also have. Um, kids with dysgraphia often have difficulty organizing thoughts, organizing thoughts and putting them on paper. So planning is, an, is, is planning and how to put something in writing. It just doesn't come. And, you know, and again, uh, taking notes while somebody's talking, very difficult because if you're slow at forming your letters and so on, you may think perfectly well, but being able to transfer what you're learning onto a piece of paper or even on a laptop, you know, it may be really challenging. Um, spelling and grammar rules very are inconsistent uh, and uh, often ignored. And often, to, and you'll see a lot of in, incorrect spacing and letters, words jammed together, and you know, uh, and and running out of room, and then putting lots of little words at the end so you can hardly read them. And then these folks often will have trouble with aligning columns in math problems sometimes. Um, so there, you know, there's a seems to be a sort of a visual spatial issue. 
Now, here's some images of dysgraphia um, of students who, uh, you know, who are, um, that you can see. Uh, and, um, and we see these, we see this a lot here. So, um, and it's a challenge. It's a challenge to, um, to read these, <laughs> to read these. I had a student, um, a college student, when I taught at Landmark College in, in Vermont, who, um, <clears throat> who had, you know, ter who was significantly dysgraphic and dyslexic, but, um, and, but he had a real strong voice in what we call a voice in writing. Um, so that he wrote quite a bit. It was hard to read, but when you, if you could read it, it was really, um, you know, not, it had flow, it, it had a voice and so on. However, um, his, all through high school, um, he failed English because the teacher couldn't read his writing. Um, and, and I, you know, I can understand that, although, you know, but so we, we actually, started him using uh using voice recognition and all of a sudden that all of his thoughts and so on came out in a readable um legible form and it was brilliant you know sad um so um i think that That I think I I think based on the research that I've read, and also my own experience in in uh, with handwriting. I will be honest. I used to think hand you know what an annoying thing to have to teach kids cursive. I never really loved cursive handwriting instruction myself, and I thought, well, you know, we've got golly, we've got we've got um, keyboarding and voice recognition and all these wonderful tools. So what the heck however what we've learned in um uh, in more recent research and a woman named virginia berninger has done a lot of this research um is that um is that it's actually handwriting is actually an important tool for developing literacy in younger children and uh, because as they form the letters, they are also learning, you know, the what the letters look like, what they're named, and how they sound. And that's and that adds a um, that adds a uh, you know a kinesthetic and um, uh, tactile kind of uh, aspect to the task. And um, and in addition to that, they with good instruction they learn correct letter formation, which is going to help them uh, for a long time. Because let's face it, life is a little easier if even if you don't write long letters anymore, if you can quickly write down some things, um, it, it's still in this 21st century is still an, a good skill to have. And what we also have learned is that um, is that keyboarding, while it is an extremely useful tool, it doesn't help students with writing tasks until they get to around sixth grade or so. Not that you shouldn't. I think it's important to teach keyboarding to students, maybe starting around fourth grade, third, fourth grade. Um, but to be able to actually produce much writing, uh, they're not going to be able to really manage that with a standard uh, keyboard until they're a little bit older. So, in so I think um, writing tasks for younger children require handwriting, and um, and it's uh, and it, it 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 will help them more with the writing process if they can easily write uh things 
And um, now the next one is interesting. High stakes tests that require writing tasks don't allow students to use laptops and keyboarding. Of course, now, now that um, all sorts of colleges and universities have announced that they're getting rid of the ACT or the SAT, that may be less, uh, less of a concern, but I don't know, but that generally is true. The other thing too, is that there's actually great research on uh, note-taking and uh, what um, some very good studies have been done on um, the effects of uh, note-taking and, um, on, and a particularly well done study took, um, was on college students and some of them took notes by hand and some of them took notes on a laptop and the students who took notes by hand did substantially, significantly better on their exams. And the, what, in digging down into that, into that result, what the researchers noted was that um, students who took notes by hand somehow seem to absorb conceptual knowledge more than students taking notes on the laptop because when students take notes on a laptop even if they're very good at, good at it they're essentially transcribing what the what the lecturer or the teacher is saying so that uh, which is a, a more um, a shallower kind of processing than when you are taking notes by hand and you can't write it all down so you you make choices and so if you take notes by hand you're more likely to remember them and to remember them in a uh, somewhat deeper, uh, with more depth than if you just, you know, tossed off things on a laptop. And who would know that, you know, who would think that? But now as we are into an era where uh, laptops and, and devices are, you know, everywhere, um, and they do so many things really well. I'm not arguing that we should get rid of laptops or things like that, but um, or recording lectures or anything else. But um, it's very difficult to take notes if your handwriting is slow and awkward. There are um, there are some uh, note taking uh, apps and software that that can be used, but they're not fabulous. Um, and then there, of course there's recordings and a lot of times um, teachers or instructors in universities will record their lectures and put them up on a website, which, but then you have to go back and listen to the whole lecture over again. And that's not the most efficient thing to do. So, um, so, being able to write well and to be able to take notes by hand is a definite advantage. Now, um, interestingly, at, uh, at, at Groves, um, we, uh, oh, at this point now, about three years ago, I had been reading all this research on handwriting and its effect on literacy and, uh, you know, just one thing and another. Um, and so I went to our lower school teachers um, in, in, in Gross and said, who, you know, taught handwriting, but didn't really expect students to use it regularly. And I went to them and I said, I really would like you, here's why I really want you to teach handwriting. Um, and, uh, uh, and I mean, really teach it and really have students use it. And they all kind of looked at me like uh, one more thing um, and so on, but they did it. And the difference in the kind of writing that we see has been phenomenal, just phenomenal. So I am, uh, uh, you know, the, the change from the chicken scratch sort of writing that, that we, the students often come in with, to really very extremely legible cursive handwriting, you know, was demonstrated that in fact, good handwriting instruction and practice. The important thing is instruction is one thing, 
practice is what's really, really necessary. And there are a number of really good handwriting, cursive handwriting programs. Um, we've been using one called Preventing Academic Failure, PAF, um, which is a very good one. Um, and it, it has, um, it has some, uh, it has some uh, plenty of opportunity for practice. Um, for copying and practicing and so on. The um, Wilson language um, has a cursive writing program. Their foundations program, uh, which is a literacy program for reading and spelling for uh, students in grades K through three, has a cursive writing component to it which so that as students are learning letters, they're learning how to print and spell and write them. Um, so, and there are and there are others too um, that uh, that 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 are good. Whatever the program is, though, it's really important that the students use it. It's not just a fifteen or ten minutes a day. You have to hold them accountable for using what they've been taught. And uh, so I, um, but you're giving them. By by hand by teaching them good cursive writing, you're giving them a gift really that will hold them in good stead um, over time. Um, so, why? What are the you know why? Other than the reasons I've already given, why do we want explicit handwriting with practice? Well, it turns out that it actually engages a lot of different uh, systems in the brain. So it does develop some, you know, graphomotor skills. Um, and as I said, there's a sensory component, the kinesthetic um, aspect of learning to form letters. And, and the other thing that handwriting does, and this is really key, I think, is that it it, it supports and strengthens that letter sound connection that's necessary. And when we get to dyslexia, uh, I'll talk more about how important the uh, sound awareness and sound uh, processing, phonological processing is for both reading and spelling and handwriting supports that. Um, and one thing too is that there's something about you know handwriting instruction and spelling when they're linked. Um, without that, it you know writers often are just blocked. They have a lot of trouble trans. Is very great. It's a lot like math and you know, in, in that sense of being cognitively really complex. So in order to translate ideas into language, your writing or, or keyboarding or your method of putting things into language, into written language, requires a lot of, uh, requires that you be pretty automatic at, at the way that you can produce letters uh, and words in writing. So um, by, by, by having students practice and using handwriting uh, that they've learned, basically It seems like Ellen cut out here for a second. So let's see if she pops back. Ellen, are you there?
All right, looks like Ellen's just gonna try and log back in here. Thanks for your patience. And um, oh darn, it looks like she's going again. And uh, let's see, is that up? I think I just shared it. Yes, I can see it. Great, sorry about that. And I will. There we go. Okay. Um, okay, so in um, we were talking about handwriting and uh, remediation and so on. Um, first of all, I think, you know, um, the uh, multi sensory or structured language instruction can be um, really helpful in terms of improving spelling. And uh, to be able to teach reading without teaching spelling at the same time and linking them is not good practice. So um, we use at Groves, um, our students, uh, our, a lot of our students are there to have reading rem remediated. And we use the Wilson reading system. Uh, but also for some students, they do better with a, um, uh, a more um, a sort of a speech to print approach and the spell links, word study and spelling curriculum is also good. But most of all, it's important to teach spelling as a part of reading instruction. Um, in fact, uh, good spelling instruction is really good reading instruction too. and um, which builds the knowledge of word patterns and so on. And handwriting instruction is key, uh, I think. And I also think it's very explicit instruction in writing, in how to write a sentence, what a good sentence is, what a good paragraph is, how to make multi, how to form multi-paragraph essays is really key. Because, you know, again, writing is a very complicated activity. It requires, you know, linguistic knowledge in terms of how written uh, structures work, and it also um, it also requires, you know, some reference to world knowledge to write about something that's happening around them and express that, and also what social cognition in that teaching teaching students that you're writing for somebody else and they must have a sense of their audience uh, too so that um so i tend to just while journal writing can be useful i really like to see students writing as if they're writing for someone else maybe book reviews or you know or uh explanation summaries of various things um and so by embedding writing instruction in, 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 in all content areas, you will be able to, you know, work on the, you know, improving uh, sentences and, um, and, and paragraphs and so that they're more robust and they provide more information. It also improves organizational skills because again, Planning is key to writing. And then be, as you're writing about what you're reading, it improves your reading comprehension um, and helps you have learn better study skills. So I think um, by, by teaching writing structures in a very uh, planned way, you, uh, you, you, you're teaching a lot of things of life skills, of skills that students will need when they move beyond school. We use a program at Groves um, called the Writing Revolution. Um, Judith Hoffman uh, created that program, that writing program at the Windward School, which is in White Plains, New York, and is a school like Groves for students with 
uh, learning difficulties. And um, that she's also used it significantly in schools in New York, Washington, DC, and so on that um, teach students who are significantly at risk because of their uh, backgrounds and uh, uh, and their the availability of literacy to them and so on and has had tremendous tremendous results and we have two so um, again and I'll probably repeat this but if you're supporting students that have a language-based LD, like dysgraphia or dyslexia, um, you want to make sure that you have a multi-sensory structured language approach, that students receive handwriting instruction in their lower grades. You can teach handwriting. There's a sort of a myth that you can't teach handwriting to anybody over the age of eight. Um, and that's wrong. You can teach handwriting to adults but it takes more time. Uh, keyboarding instruction also so that they become efficient keyboarders and then uh, and then learning strategies, you know, metacognitive comprehension strategies, sentence writing strategies, paragraph writing strategies, the strategy approach, um, teaching strategies to students uh, has been long shown in research to be um, to be very effective with students with, um, who have learning challenges um, and language-based challenges to that they have um, an approach to things so that they can you know, internalize that and then use it, apply it more generally. Um, so in terms of accommodations too for um, for students who have uh, writing issues, um, you there's a lot of assisted assistive technology that are that's that's good. Um, the um, if a student has uh, is a slow reader or has difficulty reading, having a text reader uh, like Kurzweil 3000 or Snap and Read, uh, which is a Google extension can be extremely helpful reading websites, reading anything. Um, audiobooks through, through organizations like Learning Ally or Bookshare or Audible, also really useful. And then vo voice recognition, certainly. And Dragon Naturally Speaking is, um, uh, is, has been a stalwart program. Uh, we use it at Groves, but it's also important to note that the operating systems in um, uh, in the um, in Windows, uh, particularly, and others probably too. And I know actually Apple has always had some voice recognition. You know, in the operating system itself, there are accessibility features now, such as the text reader and also voice recognition that are really pretty good. So um, if those work for you, then that's part of your uh, operating system and you don't have to necessarily go purchase uh, expensive other software. And um, you know, keyboarding, of course, is an important skill, but um, using spell predict, spell check, of course, has been around for a long time and it's incredibly useful. Spell predict is, uh, is actually like spell check kind of on steroids, which it gets used to uh, how you write and it will predict words that you're gonna write uh, and you can sort of see which, you know, and choose their spellings. It's just a little more, a little more robust than spell check. And uh, Grammarly is a great program for checking grammar and is, you know, and I know lots of students who find and people who find it really uh, useful. Other accommodations for uh, that 
that work well for um, people who have difficulty with writing. Uh, you know, getting extended time on tests is a standard accommodation. Sometimes you can get tests read orally, and um, the use of class note takers for those who have difficulty taking notes. Although, uh, although I think it's crucial that students who are using a class note taker really need to go over those notes, highlight what's important, and um, you know, and really review them. Just having somebody else take notes and then not doing much with them is not good. The idea is you need to you need to involve engage yourself with notes, <clears throat> um, either by taking them yourself or look or looking going over those that have been taken for you to in order to really absorb the material. And at this point, I am going to stop and pause for a moment um, because before we dive into reading the reading brain and then dyslexia. So how about if we take, oh, I'm, what do you think, Joanna, five minutes, 10 minutes? Um, yeah, let's yeah, do a quick five minute break. We do have a few questions though. Oh, sure. Why don't we do first. questions first? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Absolutely. So there, there's a few. Um, the first one was going back to talking about handwriting. Yeah. Um, and it says, um, so what about still using handwriting without tears? Is that relevant anymore? Handwriting without tears. Um, yeah. Uh, it, that was developed actually by occupational therapists. Um, you know, I, I think it's probably fine. It's often recommended. Okay. Um, the, the, uh, it's method, um, it has lots of practice books and things like that. The temptation is to, um, though, is to use the, you know, get, assign the practice books for, um, you know, for independent practice work and then not, not, not follow up with, um, having students actually use the handwriting. Um, so, but yeah, handwriting without tears is okay. Um, it's not my favorite, but, um, you know, I think, you know, I really like the PAF program myself. <clears throat> um, and then one question we got um, early on in this section was about when you were talking about some research that was being done and someone asked what the name of the writing researcher was that you were talking about. Oh, okay. Um, the you mean the um, the note taking um, the the uh, uh, handwriting versus uh, uh, laptop? Yeah, um, I have that. Um, if you could take that person's name, I can um, I I can easily um, and I maybe on our break I can see if I can find it, but. Um, if you could take that person's name and um, email address, I'm happy to email. And I think I probably even have a PDF of the study. Great. I'd be happy to send out that. It's okay. really an interesting study. And then let's see, someone was asking about co-writer universal. Yeah, co-writer's great. We use that at Groves. Um, and um, it, uh, it provides spell predict. Um, it allows you to... Uh, to read back, uh, have your your um, writing read back to you, so that you can listen to it, which is also a really really good reading um, strategy. Great. All right, I think it's break time. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Yes, if people think of any more questions, that's. Terrific. All right. Well, welcome back. Um, <clears throat> the um, uh, before we talk about dyslexia, um, I think it's important to understand the reading brain, how reading occurs, uh, because uh, because as humans, we were we never evolved to read, so we did evolve to speak. So reading uh, is a fairly late uh, developing skill 
that humans are capable of. Um, and people have been speaking much, much thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of years uh, uh, before they started reading. So um, how do we do that? Well, I think that's uh, important to know. How does the brain learn to read? So first of all, the brain is, we say plastic, which means it's changeable. It can make new connections uh, based on things that people do. Um, so, um, you know, and uh, so it doesn't have, unlike, uh, it doesn't have a special place that's, you know, that where that's a center of Re, you know, of reading and so on. It actually, what it does is it takes the older neuronal circuits, neural circuits that are used in, that we use for oral language and we reuse them for written language. And so how does that, you know, how does that work? Well, first of all, um, we have to be able to recognize words. So that means we have to be able to uh, recognize, be aware of sounds. And the fact is that words are made up with sounds that are glued together. Um, and we also then have to be able to decode words, recognizing the symbols, the, the letters in the word and the sounds that they make and put them together to be able to figure out how to pronounce a word um, or what the word is. But beyond that, we also have to be able to recognize words by sight, which goes beyond just what we used to call sight words, learning kind of irregular words, but really we want to be a good reader. You have to recognize pretty much every word that you see by sight. Um, and then we also have to be automatic at the <clears throat> at the word recognition. I mean, automatic in terms of of uh, being able to do it quickly. Uh, in order to be a good reader, you also have to have knowledge of vocab vocabulary, um, and then all and context and how words are used in context and things. And then also. Um, we need background knowledge to uh, understand, you know, what's the why or the how behind the words we're reading and the ability to make inferences uh, based on what we're reading. And those are the things that good readers can do. So how do they get there? Well, um, <clears throat> the uh, development of the reading brain um, one acronym that you could use for it is POSSUM, um, meaning that we need phonology, which refers to the P-H-O-N is sound there. You can see that. The sound structure of the language. The fact that letters have sounds and those sounds, uh, and there's that close connection between the letter, the visual letter, form and the sound. We also have to have, um, so we have to also, that's actually the orthographic part is mapping the sound to the letter, but we also have to be able to hear the sounds and process those sounds. Um, and the better we can do with that, the more, the easier it is to recognize uh, the letters and then hence the meaning of the words. So the semantic, part and then syntax or how words are combined in connected text. The fact that we have sentences made up of a subject and a verb, that there are sentences, discrete sentences, paragraphs. And then lastly, morphemes or word roots or word ele elements um, that, uh, that make up words, prefixes and suffixes. And English has a ton of these. Um, Partly because our the English language is uh, comes from a variety of languages. It comes from German. It's I think it's considered part of the German, you know, one of the 
a, a kind of a weird offshoot of, of German, um, <clears throat> but it also has uh, Latin roots. It has French, a lot of French, uh, some Greek, and um, you know, so it's lots of borrowed words and word parts uh, that are in our language. So here you see <clears throat> the left side of the brain, and this is what basically happens when some when you read a word. Now, this happens much more quickly than what it's going to look like here. But the first thing we have is in the occipital lobe, which is toward the back of the brain, oddly enough. And that is where, you know, where sight, where that's important to sight. So that's where we identify visual letters in that area. Um, and then, we have an area in the middle of the brain, more or less, that processes um, the, uh, meaning, the, the meanings of sounds and the words in order to understand what is being heard. Then we have to process in, in, in the front area, Broca's area, processing the sounds of language to create speech. So it goes from letter identification, <clears throat> the meanings of the sounds and the word and processing the sounds to create the speech. So um, we have the visual letter identification, C, A, T there. And then here that gives us a picture of a cat so that we, which is our understanding. And then over here, we have um, the sounds. And uh, I, it's k at, not k, k at. Uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> I have these slides on a number of presentations and I routinely go through and get rid of the UH and the, U, you know, the UHs, but Somehow this one made it in without my having done that. Anyway, so these areas here um, in the, on the left side of the brain, these have to be, have to have neural pathways that develop between them. And that, you know, that takes, that, that takes time. So, um, so initially every single human brain has to go through the process of recognizing letters, understand meaning, understand sounds, and link them together so fast that you can look at the word cat and, and, and read it, know what it means in, in less than a second, basically. So um, uh, this, is, uh, <clears throat> this is a much more complicated vis version of, you know, uh, view of where things are in the brain. Um, and I'm not gonna, there will not be a test, so you don't have to remember those, but there you see, um, we have, you know, basically visual, visual inputs over here um, to visual word form area, um, the meaning and pronunciation, and that visual word form area is very, very crucial to, uh, to rapid identification of words and speed with which that can occur. So early literacy development <clears throat> basically starts with word recognition, first of all. Well, I mean, they kind of, do, they, they basically, all these factors develop more or less, you know, in, in their own way, gradually, until they finally uh, weave into a, you know, the skilled reading rope. So this is a, a sort of a famous visual um, <clears throat> by, um, by a researcher to identify and become kind of classic. So for word recognition, we need, you know, awareness of sounds, individual sounds, and the fact that there are syllables too that words are made up of sounds and then longer words are made up of syllables, um, we have to, and that's just awareness of the sounds and the words, but
but then to decode them, we need to have uh, need to know that there's a spelling and a sound correspondences. So there's sound to to symbol, and that has to be very automatic. And then eventually we get to with enough orthographic mapping, we can recognize these words by sight. So it isn't enough just to be able to decode words. You have to be able to um, retain them so that you can literally read at the speed of sight. And that's word recognition. But then, of course, we have um, up here, in terms of the language comprehension, then we need to have knowledge of print concepts, you know, of uh, different types of reading and so on. Uh, just the ability to um, to recognize, you know, that um, that there are capitals at the beginning of sentences and periods at the end, and uh, you know, the paragraphs are sometimes indented and so on. Then there's um, vocabulary. The amount the num amount of words that you know will inform your ability to read and understand. Um, and then knowing language structures, syntax, meanings, and so on, sentences, paragraphs, essays, etc. And then add to that, you know, background knowledge, because if you read about something that you know something about, you're much more likely to pay attention to it and to understand it. And oftentimes, the more you know about something, the more eager you are to read more about it. And then, of course, there's the verbal reasoning, the ability to read and read so-called read between the lines, understand uh, references, inferences, metaphors, etc. And those all weave together, and this is, believe it or not, called the simple view of reading, and there's really nothing simple about it, but um, this is what has to come together. Um, and there is some executive control, executive function issues that go into weaving all this together eventually. We didn't used to think that there were, but now we know that that's true. Okay. And so for reading comprehension, you need to have accurate decoding. You need to have reading fluency which means that you can read not only with some speed, but also with some expression um, so that you know, you know, you can hear a voice reading to you. And then listening, if you can listen and comprehend, then with these things in place, with all these things in place, then you are likely, then reading comprehension will be better. And again, executive function coordinates these various sub-processes. So if something is off, then reading comprehension can, in various parts of these, of this triad here, then reading, uh, you know, then reading will be compromised. And we often see some of those difficulties emerge in, um, when executive function is an issue, in around middle school when texts get harder to read and understand. So that basically is an, a picture of the of the uh, of reading skill, reading and spelling skill acquisition. So I'm going to ask, Jonna, do we have any questions at this point before we dive into dyslexia? Nope, I haven't gotten any questions yet. Okay, good. Okay, so let's go into now. Dyslexia <clears throat> is understanding now how the reading brain works, then dyslexia helps us understand where glitches can occur. And so basically um, the official ver uh, explanation of, of dyslexia is you know, that it's a brain-based disorder that's basically, that mostly results from difficulty processing the sounds of a language. It sort of starts there. And if you can't 
process sounds or recognize individual sounds in words, then um, when you're hearing them, then it's going to make a, a big difference in how well you're able to attach the sounds to letters. And so um, if you, if this, this will affect reading, writing, and spelling. Now, of all learning disabilities <clears throat> that we saw in that graphic that I started with, dyslexia accounts for about 80% of them. So dyslexia is by far the most common of all learning disabilities. Sally Shaywitz wrote a book called Overcoming Dyslexia. And um, originally, um, originally 2003, but she does have a second edition, um, calls it an unexpected weakness in a sea of strength. Because we know, too, that people with dyslexia often have, um, while they may have difficulty with reading, that they may have also many other strengths that, um, that they, uh, that will, <clears throat> that will serve them well over their lifespan. So here's an, uh, in terms of a population study, um, again, about 20% of people roughly have, uh, have what could be called diagnosed as dyslexia. And um, so, and you know, this 80% here, they have their ability to process sounds and language intact and they can um, uh, and learn to read and usually spell also, for, for if they're taught well, if they're taught properly. Now, this 10 to 13% are people who have difficulty with decoding based on their ability to process sounds. And then, but seven to 10% have more serious problems that are usually compounded by some other cognitive uh, or linguistic features here too. So that's kind of how things break down. So basically, <clears throat> we think of dyslexia, there's some, somewhere in the brain, there's a glitch that interferes with, um, you know, with, with, uh, development of the reading brain. It's possible that they have, uh, you know, have maybe a structural or functional difficulty for some reason. Um, several genes, there's a genetic issue too that are linked to dyslexia and that play, play, plays a role in early brain development. So you, you will see families where uh, dyslexia occurs in multiple generations. Um, sometimes brain development after birth can affect the connections of the neural networks. Um, and then there may be, you know, vision or hearing or other perceptual development, sensory motor development that affects reading and language development. And then there are environmental factors that I don't know, you know, again, we argue about is this true dyslexia, but people who come who have come from homes where reading is not common, low home literacy, uh, parents don't have a very strong educational background, there are uh, cultural influences that are that have a somewhat negative effect, um, can affect reading development. Now, a lot of these guys, um, uh, the environmental factor thing, you know, can, um, <clears throat> uh, could be, a, you know, could be when those are changed or when good reading instruction occurs, some of that is mitigated for sure. Um, then, um, so then what happens, you'll see, we have a lot, we, we understand quite well now what happens in brain function when to someone who has dyslexia. And we're able to, to describe how it looks and acts quite well. <clears throat> we're at the point now in, in research where researchers are really going deeper into um, looking more at, um, you know, structural 
uh, structural changes in the brain that occur in dyslexia uh, more than how than looking at you know what how the function is. So here, you know, we talked about uh, three reading areas here, and here they are in a non-impaired reader. In a scan, you will see, um, you know, the neural networks, the electric neural networks, will show up as being active on that the left side of the brain when reading. Um, and that just you know shows that those 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 areas are connected and they're functioning. Now, in someone with dyslexia, the same side of the brain, you're likely only to see electrical activity and the neur neural activity in the front of the brain here. And the other, you know, uh, letter recognition and other language areas are not lighting up. And so we, we see that this person has functionally has a very different neural structure going on than this person here. So a lot of our remediation attempts, <clears throat> uh, remedi remediation efforts are toward building up the neural activity uh, in the left side of the brain so that reading is more natural. So there's a bunch of misconceptions about dyslexia. One is that it's related to IQ and it has nothing to do with IQ. Um, many of our greatest inventors, uh, scientists, uh, thinkers are, had, have had dyslexia. Um, certainly um, uh, Thomas Edison, who invented, I don't know, the phonograph, you know, and the, and the uh, light bulb and so on. Brilliant. And he uh, he had nothing beyond a third grade education because his teacher told his mother that he was uh, too stupid to benefit from school, so she took him out. And, you know, so he, um, which is sad, although maybe, you know, again, um, he was one of those people, you know, many times people with dyslexia are really good problem solvers, and that may be. Uh, you know, that may have accounted for his uh, persistence and ability to invent so many things. Um, if there's a misconception that it's uncommon. It's not uncommon, as you saw. Roughly 20% of any given population will, uh, will have uh, some form of, some, you know, some uh, form of dyslexia, whether it's severe to a little less severe. There's a misconception that it's rare in females, and that's not true. Um, although there does seem to be um, a slight gender difference between males and females in terms of uh, in terms of incidence of dyslexia, and of course, a lot of people think it's related. Well, he doesn't want to learn. Well, I mean, if you have to go every day and fail at the one thing that everybody else is learning to do, your motivation is very limited. You know, why should I even try to understand, you know? And then another misconception is reversal of letters. Now, you'll see rever reversal of letters is something that's common in young children um, who are developing in the developing literacy stage. Kids reverse letters, they reverse numbers. Um, and then they seem to move beyond that. So people with dyslexia reverse letters, and that kind of reflects where they are in the literacy development stage. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are a number of theories of why they reverse letters, but, you know, but the most recent I read was that, you know, um, <clears throat> they're, developmentally behind in terms of developing literacy and that comes letter reversal comes with that there's also a misconception that it's caused dyslexia is caused by visual impairments <clears throat> that is not true now there is there's some visual issues in a small maybe 10 percent of people with dyslexia have uh, some visual issue, but the idea that you can put your child into um, into you know into uh, visual tracking uh, to improve dyslexia is is 
false, wrong, a complete waste of money. And that's been proven over and over again. So um, uh, visual tracking is not going to cure dyslexia. In fact, nothing really cures dyslexia because it, if your brain uh, function, structure, et cetera, <clears throat> uh, you can vastly improve your ability to uh, read and write, but the the underlying issue of dyslexia and the and the fact that you know it, it it'll impact speed if not other things too, it is a you know it is a lifelong um, syndrome, so it cannot be outgrown, and it cannot be cured. Uh, and the idea that oh you know the teachers will tell people you know just wait a little while he'll he'll come along he'll develop is sadly uh, just puts kids further and further behind. So beware of the wait, let's wait and see approach. On the other hand, there are strengths, significant strengths to dyslexia. <clears throat> One is, and I think I referred to this earlier, is the spatial awareness. Visual spatial awareness is, uh, is, can be very keen. So you find people, it, uh, you know, in the area of sports and, um, and acting, um, architects, plumbers, contractors, people who, um, who, who have to really, who have to, who have a strong knowledge um, of where they are in space and where other things are in space, <clears throat> like <clears throat> are, um, there's a decent number of them who have dyslexia because there's, you know, those things have been, you know, particularly developed. Oftentimes people with dyslexia have great mechanical aptitude. They tend to have creative approaches to problem solving because they can't necessarily do it the way everybody else does it. So they often develop different ways, alternative ways of solving problems that uh, turn out to be uh, in many ways, you know, mind blowing. They uh, <clears throat> oftentimes can connect disparate, you know, different pieces of a puzzle and see where things will fit together. They tend to be good at visualizing things and artistic expression. Now, that's not to say every person with dyslexia can do all these things, but we do find that there's uh, there's a tendency of these these particular skills to be stronger in, in uh, the dyslexic population. Um, <clears throat> which brings us to what we call the trade-off model of dyslexia because <clears throat> individuals with dyslexia um, have different patterns. They, they actually, it's their brain uh, structure function is just, they have a different alternative kind of function, brain structure that allows them to see things in three dimensions um, and to spot all sometimes, you know, relationships between concepts, viewpoints, objects, sometimes can connect different perspectives. Um, oftentimes can <clears throat> get, in, can, 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 can gather information um, into a single kind of big picture perspective and, uh, you know, understand the context of things. And so um, that often, you know, again, has to do with uh, brain function uh, and um, so on. So that's, there's research to support that. Um, it's somewhat controversial, but, you know, it, there are, uh, there's decent research to support this and it's ongoing. So, um, the core deficit of dyslexia is what we call phonological processing, which is being able to recognize sounds or phonemes individually in a word, um, such as <clears throat> if I ask without showing any letters or um, any letters or pictures or anything else, if I say, to someone, uh, a child, what are the sounds in the word sun? And 
they're able to say, uh, mm, great, great. For someone with dyslexia, they are likely not, a young child with who is dyslexic likely cannot do that. Um, so we, uh, and, and that is, and, and so how they process sounds is one of the first things that we look at when we're looking at children who are having difficulty learning to read. Um, and as a result of that, spelling really depends on translating sounds into symbols. And so if the sounds are fuzzy or, uh, you know, or you don't have a, a great connection between a sound and a letter, spelling is going to suffer. Um, and again, we do see letter reversals, B and D very commonly, P and Q, and, uh, you know, are, are, are less common, but you see them. And then there also will be a vowel sound confusion that you notice in students, like, like E eh and I eh get confused, A eh and A, ah, A ah and A. Uh. These are all short vowel sounds, which is what we teach first. Um, and so that, you know, these are all clues that um, attention needs to be paid and very direct instruction in letter sound correspondence needs to occur. It doesn't, uh, some, you know, again, it's a spectrum. Some people, you know, there are some kids that just are born with it and they will learn to read no matter what method, no matter how terrible it is, they will learn to read. Others, will really struggle unless they have very direct um, and a uh, very direct instruction in um, you know in sound simple correspondence now there are cognitive factors that will affect reading and spelling they don't cause reading and spelling but they're there which is you know if someone has slow processing and slow information retrieval that will cause some issues because it will take longer to make the connections between the letters and the sounds. And then poor working memory, as with everything, is going to, you know, will complicate acquisition of letter sound correspondence and sight word, you know, retrieval of words and so on. Um, <clears throat> they just, they make it worse or they make it more complicated, but they don't cause it. And then language processing is, a, is also a complicating factor. So expressive language, which is your ability to um, speak and express uh, thoughts and uh, ideas in language, you know, orally, and your receptive language deficit, de deficit which is your ability to understand what others are saying, these will affect uh, will affect how uh, the difficult you know will make it a more difficult to learn um, to be remediated. I mean, it it can ha it, it's possible, but they will complicate it, and it does cause for some you know calls for some adjustments in instruction. Uh, there's working memory, uh, just we to review all of that, um, you know, all of that, uh, those, those uh, tasks uh, are made more difficult if working memory uh, is compromised in any way. So basically if, you know, what parents can do is to, um, <clears throat> is to first get, and I, I mean, I, I said this before, and you know, I think one of the most helpful things is, is as soon as possible, if you suspect a problem in learning, to get a good psychoeducational evaluation. And what that involves is an IQ test, which measures cognitive function, achievement, and it's paired with achievement tests, which measure reading, spelling, math, writing, achievement. And oftentimes, what you'll see is um, a, a gap between 
cognitive ability, which might be quite strong, and then lower, you know, a gap between achievement and reading and spelling and so on. Oftentimes, though, um, being having dyslexia does not mean that math is a problem. It oftentimes there are people with dyslexia who are very talented at math and so on. But it will affect spelling, reading, and writing as a result. Um, there are oftentimes uh, then the examiner will will give additional tests to sort of probe into some other cognitive functions such as phonological processing to find out what about processing of sounds is difficult for for an individual you know also extra um, you know additional tests or probes into processing speed uh, executive function memory and so on then the uh, the examiner will provide a diagnosis a coded diagnosis according to the dsm-5 and recommendations for treatment and these diagnostic recommendations then are is your guide to what to do there may be tutoring recommended there may be treatment programs recommended uh, and uh, will vary in intensity depending on uh, the severity of, of of the deficit or difficulty then um, based on that you can communicate and partner with the school possibly an IEP or a learning specialist, depending on whether you are in a public or private setting. Um, and, um, you know, there, and this, this, this touches on a whole subject in and of itself, which is how do you get the public schools to provide uh, appropriate remediation and accommodations and so on for your for your child, um, and I, I don't, uh, there, I don't. It's too comprehensive to get in now. Although I can take some questions about it, to an extent. Um, okay, so actually, now, do we have questions before we get into what does good scientifically based instruction look like? It looks like we have a few questions. Um, so the first one is, um, does the P, P I'm assuming PSAT, um, address the phonological tests? Does that make sense? PSAT? Or PAST, sorry. Oh, the PAST. <laughs> yeah, okay. The PAST is, um, uh, is, is an assessment, if I'm correct, the PAST is an, is an assessment of phonological awareness. Um, that David Kilpatrick uh, developed as part of his Equipped for Reading Success um, program for increasing. The past will um, address phonological awareness, and I like it because it it does hone in on where uh, you know what at what level does the is the phonological awareness. Uh, you know, what level is it, uh, is phonological awareness at so that you can, you know, gives you an idea of where you can start to remediate it. Uh, the past is just a phonological awareness screening, um, but it's, it's, it's easy to give and I like it and I love David Kilpatrick's Equip for Reading Success program. Um, ones that, that, uh, that, uh, that a psychologist would likely be giving would probably be something more like the CTOP, which is the Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing. And that involves, um, that's standardized, which the past is not, which means that there, it's, you get percentiles and standard scores and stuff compared to some, you know, uh, cohort. Um, and uh, and again gives a sort of a somewhat deeper, uh, more you know wider uh, wider analysis of um, skills phonological that are involved in phonological awareness. I like the CTOP a lot too. Um, and um, uh, so yeah, okay. 
Right. And then what about Sally Schwitz universal dyslexia screener? Is it worth the money? Ah, uh, I don't know. I, you know, she's a, a very prominent researcher and she, it's probably very good. I, I will be honest with you. I don't, I haven't read a review of it and I haven't used it. So I can't, um, and I don't know how much it costs. Um, my guess is that it's that she's a, so she's so uh, well respected and knowledgeable that it probably is a good screener, you know, and probably cheaper than um, <laughs> getting psycho educational assessments. Unfortunately, are quite expensive. Okay. Okay. And then the last question I have here. Um, with reference to a third grade student, uh, mm -hmm. about how many hours of special education assistance should a child with severe dyslexia be getting per week? Um, well, let me tell you this. I mean, I think that um, I think that a child with severe dyslexia uh, ought to be getting, you know, if possible um they should they should be getting um they should be getting instruction daily um and i you know i think uh and if they get it less than daily they ought to have at least three times a week for 45 minutes to an hour which i don't know that there's public schools who do that but it takes you know it uh there ought to be, uh, it, first of all, there has to be somebody who's trained, who's doing the remediation, using a scientifically based uh, reading instruction, reading and spelling instruction uh, program for um, really at least 40 to 45 minutes um, and longer. You know, if they, on, if they only do a half an hour, but they do it daily, you know, I mean, you kind of, you know, you, then you see, but yeah, it's, there's what they should get and then there's what they will get. Um, and, and so oftentimes public schools are, um, don't do, some do, some, some it varies, but there are a lot of public schools that don't do a good job remediating dyslexia. Um, so, there's that. Okay, let me see back here. So moving into what a scientifically based reading instruction look like? Well, it needs to be direct, needs to be very explicit. It needs to be sequential. In, in other words, you introduce uh, concepts and uh, concepts in a logical sequential order. So you don't jump around and decide, hey, today, Hey, let's 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 look at let's look at the Val digraph AI today. When in fact students haven't yet mastered short vowels, so it needs to be sequential and it needs to be you know gradually one concept building on another with regular review. It needs to be multisensory in that you know children. It, it doesn't mean that kids have to play in sand trays, but it needs to be um, they see it, they hear it um they write it um and in some cases they may trace it or something like that why does this keep doing that because i probably keep hmm. sorry folks um and uh and for older students it's really helpful if it's analytical tell them why why are we doing this um you know uh why do i have to tap with my fingers you know why can't i just do it in my head. Well, you know, there's connection between the hand and the brain and so on. And ideally, um, a really good, um, <clears throat> a really good dyslexia uh, practitioner or therapist uh, should be diagnostic and prescriptive. In other words, be well enough trained that through working with a child or uh, adult with a person that they recognize where things are, where trouble spots are and address those. So lessons, they're not following a preordained script. 
they're building their um, lessons and uh, interventions based on what they've observed and what needs to happen. Um, so, um, and, and the National Reading Panel, which put out their report in 2000, which is, I think to myself, my gosh, that's 20 years ago, amazing. Um, but they identified five areas of reading instruction that needed to happen to be complete. One of the, which was the phonemic awareness, sounds in words, and phonics, the letter sound correspondence. Fluency would be their reading rate and accuracy and actually also expression, because if you can read in phrases and with expression, it, it tends to uh, support reading comprehension, vocabulary development, and reading comprehension. So all five are important. <clears throat> and, uh, and if you just teach, you know, phonemic awareness and phonics so kids can decode words and spell them, but you don't address fluency or a vocabulary or comprehend more, give them connected text that they can read, then that's just not enough. They need to have a lot of reading practice, oral reading too. So um, there are, um, you know, there are, um, it used to be that Orton Gillingham based programs were sort of the gold standard. And they are still, you know, they still are well respected and they uh, follow scientific principles. The Wilson Reading System, um, which is grades two through adult, um, <clears throat> I have used for many years. Um, the, uh, for young children, preventing academic failure is also uh, also good and sometimes adaptable to small general classrooms. The Sande system is another Orton Gillingham based uh, based program, and that one is uh, was created by Arlene Sande, who lives here in in the Twin Cities. And other research validated word study and spelling programs is, are um, the Spellings Word Study and Spelling, which is created by speech and language pathologists who are very high level ones who research and so on. And that, uh, that program focus is, is pairs well with an Orton Gillingham program. It also works well for students who are really having trouble with. Um, you know, with generalizing the concepts in some of the Orton-based programs. Then Linda Mood Bell is, um, you know, has the LIPS program, which is a, you know, a phonemic sequencing programs program that's, uh, that's quite good and a lot of research support. Seeing Stars is, uh, is, a, is a more of a reading comprehension and uh, uses a lot of visualization and so on. So all, any of these are good. But as always, it depends on the practitioner who's, you know, instructor who's teaching them. So when we're talking about building reading fluency, uh, which is that, which is what students need, you know, again, they need consistent regular oral reading practice and older students can do it too. Um, and the nice thing about oral reading support is, you, you know, it doesn't require complicated strategies or people with, you know, master's degrees and things like that. Or, um, and it does not have to be timed. There's, I think there's an overemphasis on timing words correct per minute. When in fact, um, I'd, I'd rather list, I'd rather hear somebody read uh, read in phrases uh, with expression than I would have somebody rattle off a bunch of words quickly that does where one word sounds just exactly like the other. And decoding and vocabulary need to be taught explicitly um, to be effective. Um, so actually, I um, I, I, I recommend uh, for oral reading, and this is reading at home um, or in school or whatever, but 
reading aloud is, is really crucial to fluency growth um, and it should be practiced frequently. So I, I like, and there's a lot of, you know, there've been a lot of programs directed specifically at fluency. Some of them uh, require reading the same thing over and over and over again, repeated reading and gradually moving up and so on. Um, those are not useless, but much better is to have uh, what we call wide reading, which is reading text that is that a student can read uh, approximately 80% of if they're reading with another person. Um, and then <clears throat> so that they are exposed to a lot of different, uh, you know, a, a lot of different uh, information, a lot of different vocabulary words and so on. Then, then what they need really is just um, is support for the uh, decoding the unfamiliar words and also understanding what a word means if they ask for it. So I do this with students all the time. And when, you know, I may have been spending a lot of time teaching them how to decode words, how to practice, you know, build up, you know, orthographic mapping and so on. But when we're doing uh, oral reading, I want them to get the sense of reading fluently. And so if they, you know, the, if, they, if they get to a word and they don't know it and they haven't been taught the strategy or the concept, I'll just give it to them so they can keep on going. Occasionally I'll say, I think you can figure this word out and then they, they do. And always when they ask for, uh, you know, what does this mean? I explain it to them then. I think that prosody, which really refers to expression, is more important than speed. And there's research to back that up. You know, most of our fluency progress monitoring uh, practices have to do with how many words correct can a student read in a minute. And that's, that's, that's a window into because the, the more words you can read per minute does, re, does affect comprehension. But I think we put too much emphasis on it. Um, and I think, you know, parents can do a lot at home by re having their students read orally in, in this fashion um, for, you know, 10 to 15 minutes each day is nice if you can do it. And then this is exactly what I just said. <laughs> so um, again, <clears throat> uh, choosing things. And then, you know, in terms of choosing material that's at their level, um, you can try to, you could, there are um, websites like lexile.com that helps you uh, find texts that are at your student's level or grade level or whatever. And again, the earlier you start remediation, the, the, the faster it will go. Um, because the longer that you wait, the more time it's going to take because students have had more time to learn bad strategies, uh, basically. And so earlier is better, but it's never too late. I've taught people in their 40s who had never learned to read well how to read. Um, and boy, is that, that was wonderful, but it took a long time, you know. And, who, and not everybody has that kind of time or available resources. So here we are. This is what we've covered today, which is dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia. And I want to say a little bit about some of the social emotional effects of learning disabilities, of having, a, you know, of, of a learning disability, because I think this is key, this is crucial, it's great to have great intervention strategies, but students also need to have, um, to have, to be able to um, feel validated and also um, be able to do things that they can do well. So um, there's no question, and there's lots of research and, uh, and observation to show that students who have learning disabilities um, are at risk for 
lots of, um, of um, mood disorders and other um, negative effects, you know. So uh, it's important to, to keep that in mind and to uh, look at that sort of thing too. So we, um, re building emotional resilience, there's lots of research on that and books and articles and so on about building resilience. Um, and Robert Brooks is a researcher from Harvard who has done a lot of work on that. Um, but in general, you know, encouraging their talents. Um, a lot of our students at Groves love doing like makerspace, art, music, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and also working in the wood shop and so on. Inter you know, encouraging talents and having them be able to spend time doing things that they're good at is really important. Also, maximize opportunities for social learning. Now, many people with dyslexic are fabulously social and um, love community and they're great. Others, um, others may be a little less so. Um, and so the, um, you know, but opportunities to, to be a part of a group and to be accepted by a peer group is important. And, um, you know, again, Emotional support through mentors and cooperative learning opportunities. Um, there are mentorship programs um, and, uh, that are um, uh, that are available. Students in colleges who will mentor students and so on, um, and um, and though and anything you know, older students with younger students and so on can really uh, make a difference in a child's life. And of course, practice empathy, which can be hard when you know you've spent a lot of time and a lot of money trying to remediate a student, um, and it still isn't working, and you sort of feel like, ah, you know, um, could, you know, digging down and remembering how what it must feel like to be. Um, to have this big barrier to so many things is crucial. Um, and I think um, there's also some pretty good re research on you know, reframing. We all carry around some beliefs about ourselves. We have our stories. You know. To reframe, this is a cognitive behavioral um, therapy strategy uh, that looks in, you know, looks at changing your belief about your oneself, you know. And for students with dis with who have learning disabilities, they go through in some ways, oftentimes, kind of a grief process that um, that they're not like other people. Um, they can feel angry and uh, depressed and uh, sometimes in denial. But the stages of reframing um, and a lot of the um, a lot of the movements um, of to um, build self-esteem and so on center around recognizing, okay, I learn differently. I learn differently than other people. And life is probably going to be a little harder because of that. You know, in other words, I get to run the race of life, but I have to do it with a sack of rocks on my back. You know, um, Understanding exactly what it takes to be successful and strategies to go about that. And then when you understand your disability, to plan the actions that you need to do to cope with the disability. So when you go, you know, there are, there is, uh, there are laws that provide, uh, that show that people with a disability like dyslexia um, and so on, have rights, and there are accommodations that they're entitled to, and modifications they're entitled to, and to know, you know, that maybe when I go to college, I don't take four reading, you know, four courses that require lots of reading, then I have a balance between reading courses and courses that may be based on, you know, problem solving and so on. So that um, 
uh, so that you know you can accomplish. Maybe I need to take three of some courses a semester rather than four. And those things um, are basically, uh, you know, the people who, in my experience, which is getting to be really, really long, um, in my experience, the people who do the best, the kids who do the best, the families who do the best, are those that say, okay, this is what we're facing, and they accept it. Um, and then say, all right, what are we gonna do about it? The more time you spend saying, well, maybe it isn't really that, or maybe, you know, he doesn't, it's the more time that you spend in hoping that it won't really be, or denying it or whatever, um, just, just makes the process of um, learning to be functional that much harder. Um, so, I have, um, I have in my, that you'll get this from handouts that Joanna will send you. I've got some references. I've also got some resources online that you can look at, and, and there are more. Um, so I'm going to stop share and see if we have any questions at this point. I don't have any that have come through yet. I did just send out a little chat to see if anyone has any okay. questions before we move on. Sure. Um, so far, nothing is coming in. All right, well, it's 11.33. So I think we've all maxed out our screen time and I very much appreciate being able to share my experience knowledge, et cetera, with you, and I hope it helps. So, um, um, and I think uh, on my, on the handouts that Joanna will send you is my email address. Email is the best way to get in touch with me if you have questions, and I would welcome that. Um, so with that, I will say, um, have a great rest of your day.